Okay, I think we are about ready to get started. Everybody good in the back? Everybody good in the front? Okay, good stuff. It's good to see you all here today. Really appreciate this. I'm standing in for someone who had this session, so I've rebuilt it sort of from the ground up and I've added one component. I'd love for this to be interactive. So for those of you online, if you, if you uh, post in a question, I'm happy to respond to that verbally. We'll repeat that question so that everybody gets to hear it, even in the room, and then I'll push back. We have 50 uh, minutes, five zero minutes, um, so feel free to uh, put that in your schedule that way. All right, what we're going to be talking about is uh, how managers can support their employees' mental health. So let's start out with this, because I've got a little addition I've made to this session. How many of you are currently managers? You have personnel responsibilities to someone else. How many of you are being asked or are thinking about becoming a manager? And so you're like, okay, should I, should I do this? So we're gonna start off with a very special introduction uh, to those folks first, for those of you that are managers. And again, I'm happy for us to be very interactive here. So if you have a comment, you wanna make a general comment, just raise your hand and I'll sort you out. I call this the myth reality of becoming an IT manager. And this is not completely unique to IT, but it kind of is. We seem to be an industry uh, that does this far too often. Let me give another poll question. How many of you have had predominantly good managers? Like most of your managers have been good. Wow, wow. Uh, there's people raising their hands because I've never gotten that before, ever. Uh, it's usually I've had more bad managers than good ones. How many of you would say you've had pretty few great or amazing managers, right? I'll raise my hand as well. Very unusual to have that. Some of you are self-employed and you raised your hands that you have bad managers and that's pretty frightening. Um, so uh, you may want to have a chat with yourself, just saying. Um, so let's talk about this. I, I call it a myth reality of becoming an IT manager because most of us believe that we are uh, up and we do this. So uh, for those of you watching online, I come up to, say again, we've lost the stream. All right, I'll let them sort that out. Most of us believe that we go up to a level in IT and then we get promoted into management and move up from there. Is this common for most folks? Okay, this is what's normally believed. It's rather rare that a company will have a track for the technical professional to continue to excel and get promoted and get money and get levels and get responsibility and that there is a track where you can have a junior manager that follows a parallel track and goes up this way. It's usually not a parallel stack, it's a single stack. Is that your experience as well? Fairly common, unfortunately, in IT. So these might resonate with you and, and you say, well, what do you mean by myth reality? Well, in some cases, um, it's a myth that you have to do these things. And unfortunately, in some companies, it's the reality. It is the reality that to get promoted, you have to get promoted into management. And some of us have seen that. See if any of this resonates with you. Number one, you're really good at tech. You'll make a great boss. Has anybody ever seen that? Anybody ever seen that? Yeah. Um, you're really good at what you do, ergo you should be managing people who do what you do. Now, back 100 years ago, um, that, that wasn't when I was born. My stuff goes back to the Sumerian era. But, but about 100 years ago, we had this idea of something called a supervisor. I know that may sound foreign to some folks. We had this title called a supervisor. This was a super tech in whatever it was, uh, cooking, IT, whatever it happened to be. And as they uh, began to do that, we would get somebody that would be in charge of sort of handing out work. Like, you're really good at what you do. Can you let her know what to do next? And so on. This was called a supervisor role. They didn't have budget authority or hire and fire capabilities. They weren't truly managers like we think about today. At some point in the 1980s, we started title inflation. And we didn't have secretaries. We had administrative assistants. We didn't have uh, supervisors, we had managers. We didn't have managers, we had directors. We didn't have directors, we had C-level executives. And vice presidents became an, into a thing, right? So these, these new title inflations meant 
that people who used to do supervisory type work were now called managers and were not always technically capable of doing it. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, what, what happens there and, and we go from there. You can only lead, you can only be in charge. Yes, John. Say that again, sir. Yeah, the question was, do you have, do I, Buck Woody, have a different definition of supervisor and manager? And I do. Um, a supervisor for me would be somebody who manages a line of operations, but does not have hire and fire capabilities, may have input to hire and fire, and doesn't have a budget that they control. So they're more concerned with the day-to-day -day work and getting things done. Um, we used to call these a lead. Right? They call them a lead. But nowadays, a lead is just your most senior whatever, who may have no authority whatsoever. Back in the day, you did not want to anger your supervisor because they still could get you in trouble, although not them directly. Does that make sense? And a manager, in my mind, has hire and fire capabilities and also has a budget and is able to move their employees through the organization. And in my mind, that's what a manager is. And we've seen this one too. You can only do that, you can only lead, you can only make a difference, you can only make a change in an organization if you're a manager. And this is fundamentally not true and shouldn't be true. Every level of any company should be able to do this. How many of you have ever heard of the BMW Z series of cars, sports cars? Z3, Z4, and so on. Amazing car, love it, I've owned one. This was actually a skunk works that was started by some ladies that worked at BMW and they said, you're missing a segment. And their boss was smart enough to say, tell me more, go figure it out. They came back with this design and said, here's what we need to do. And they went, let's do it. And there was a whole line of cars, which is non-trivial to do at BMW, created because somebody at the bottom was able to make a decision and lead. And that should always be true. Unfortunately, the myth reality is in some companies, if you're a worker, uh, you're not given that level of authority, that's a problem. So I'm gonna talk about all these more as well. Um, to progress in your career, you just have to become a manager. This is a myth reality. Uh, Bob Ward, who works with me at Microsoft, is a super technical person. Been at Microsoft for over 25 years. Knows, he knows everything, and nobody questions what Bob says about tech, they just don't. But he's not a manager. And I'm actually a junior in grade compared to him. I'm a manager. And so at Microsoft, we have these tracks that allow you to excel as a technical person. But not every company does this. If your company doesn't, you need to have a discussion with them about why not. Because I want to make more money. I'm a technical person. And they say, we'd love to give you more money. We'd love to let you do more things. But you got to be a manager. And so what do you do? You become a manager, but you're awful at it. And that's okay. I'm awful at a lot of things. In fact, I'm far more awful at more things than I'm good at, and that's okay. So we believe if we can't become a manager, if we don't become a manager, that's a personal failure. So unfortunately, these things are both true and false. They should be false, but they unfortunately are true. All right, let's talk about how you can become a manager or what a manager should be. This is pretty important. We talk about hard skills and soft skills. I have a problem with these terms, but we'll use them for today. Hard skills are, you know, we, we think of difficult. They're all difficult and they're all skills. But we'll go ahead and talk about things that have a prescribed set of steps and some things that are a little bit more human. So let's talk these through. What does a manager need to have? Well, before we do that, somebody came to me, I, I mentor quite a bit, and somebody came to me and said, how do I know that I want to be a manager? They're telling me I want to be a manager, and I don't know if I do or not. Number one, that's a very intelligent thing to ask instead of just doing it, right? Because it seems very prestigious to be a manager. It's not. <laughs> it's not that pleasant sometimes. But here's how you know. I'm going to give you a thought experiment. I do not want you to answer this question out loud. But I do want you to be incredibly honest with yourself. Are you ready? Can you do that? Can you promise me to be very honest with yourself with this question? 
Question one, or the first scenario. I've, I'm going to wave a magic wand. And I'm going to get you a promotion. I'm going to give you more money. And I'm going to give you some recognition within the company for what a great job you've done. That's your first option. Your second option is to assist a friend. Make sure that they achieve. You're going to cover for them when some things are broken. You're going to talk to them. You're going to listen to them. When they're done and they do their project, they're going to get promoted. They're going to get more money. And they're going to get recognized within the company. In fact, you're going to do it. You're going to be the one to do the recognizing. And you're going to never mention to anyone, nor is anyone else going to mention to anyone, that you had anything to do with it. Which of these two scenarios appeals to you? If you chose the first one, you should not be a manager. That's the hard truth of it. And you know what? It's fine. That's great. You know what I want you to do if you chose the first one? Go do that. I want you to be the best brain surgeon that there is. I want my pilot to be the best pilot in the world. I want her to fly anything, anywhere, ever. I want that person to be a super tech. I do not want them to be a crappy manager. You with me here? And a manager, number one, has a few traits that they need to do. Let's, let's start with the hard skills and walk through these. First of all, you need to have the ability to plan and organize something. You should be able to organize a riot. You need to be able to organize things and be very specific about when things happen, do work back schedules. You need to know how to use Microsoft Project in your sleep. Seriously, this is a job. Uh, we call this a project manager. You need to have a project manager skill. If you don't, you will not make a great manager. You need to have good time management. You need to be able to take your day and lay it out, not burn yourself out and not burn someone else out, and be able to know what we can do and what we can't do. Next, you need to have skills in goal setting and also decision making. Steve Jobs once said, Apple is defined by what it doesn't do, by what it says knows no to. And you need to be the same way. You're not going to be able to get it all done in one day. And your upper levels, this is called managing up as, a, as well as managing down, you need to be able to make them understand the realism of, hey, look, uh, you know, you've got the, the magic triangle, time, resources, and goal. You can't break the triangle. If you make the goal bigger, we either need more time or more resources, or both. You can't break the triangle. Your managers are three-year-olds. They will say, no, no, but you have to get it done with the people you have now. You have to, you have to, you have to. And you've got to be the person that can bring them to understand that triangle once again. You also need to be able to help your employees with their goals and decision making. You need to realize when someone should achieve a bit more and needs to be pushed a little bit in the right way. And you need to know when to back off because someone's about to burn out. You also need to know your business. If you're a manager, you're part of an organization. That organization has a belief, a culture, and a mission. If you don't know what those are or don't believe in them, please, please don't be a manager. There's nothing worse than you going to your employee and saying, well, I don't really want to do this, but you know, the company's telling us we got to. Do you know what that, that just de-empowers you like you wouldn't believe? Don't do that. If, if you don't agree with the mission, you change it. I have many times told my upper leadership, we shouldn't be doing this. This is wrong. This is not going to be the best thing for the customer. Here's why. And I had to put a, a, a whole session together to explain these things. And you need to have the technical knowledge, not technical knowledge in your job. You do not need to be better than your employee at the thing you're doing. In fact, if you're better at your, than your employee is at technology, then you should be doing the technology, not managing. You need to hire people that are very, very good in that role or get them there to where they're better than you at what they do. Your job is management. The technical knowledge I'm talking about here is the role of a manager. These things that you see here. Well, these are what we call the hard skills. 
But in fact, they're not all that's there. There's also soft skills. Number one, empathy. The first thing a manager needs to have is empathy. I have worked for psychopathic and sociopathic bosses. I've worked for people who have no empathy whatsoever. By the way, empathy is different than sympathy. Empathy means I understand how you feel. I know what you're going through. Sympathy means I feel what you feel. You cannot be sympathetic. You cannot be a thermometer and show the temperature. You need to be a thermostat and regulate the temperature. You need to be empathetic. I understand. It's okay. We're going to get this sorted out. You stay here, you do your thing, I'm gonna go figure out what's happening, we're gonna be all right. You can't be like, oh my gosh, you're right, this is the worst thing ever, I don't know what we're gonna, you panic like that, you're gonna panic your employees. You have to be empathetic. And you say, well, I'm not very empathetic. Then please, for the love of all that is right, don't be a manager. Don't be a manager. You need to be empathetic. Communication, it's better to be clear than not. How many of you have worked at companies and there's a reorg coming or there's a change coming or there's something bad going to happen and they go dark? Nobody, just me. I'm the only person that's had that happen. What happens? Everybody's fine with that, right? Everybody's cool, nobody says anything. There's no water cooler chatter, nothing like that, right? No, it all goes wrong. It's much better to get it out in the open Let's talk about what we know, what we're thinking, and so on. I share a great deal with my employees quite often. And you need to make sure that you are communicating often. With my direct reports, I meet once a week, and I have four questions. You're welcome to use these if you wish. Number one, when I meet with my employees each week, and this is over Teams, obviously, these days, what are you working on? Not because I want to micromanage them. I honestly don't know what they're working on. And you say, what? And I say, yes. I don't assign tasks. I assign areas. Here's what needs to be done. Go forth and prosper. And so they then begin to lay out their day because they have control. And I say, hey, what you working on? They say, oh, I'm doing this. And I'm like, great, why are you doing that? Oh, because I'm thinking this. Oh, that's awesome. Have you thought about this? No, I haven't. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Click. So I always ask, what you working on now? The next question I ask is, what are you working on next? because I need to know what's coming down the pike for them to know do I give them more work because the other person's busy or what? The third thing I say is do you need me for anything? Do you need my credit card? Do you need a promotion? Do you need a day off? What do you need? What do you need from me? Because I'm not, in the, in the US we have in football, I'm not good with sports ball, but as I understand it, there's a front line of people, usually big people, that keeps the other side from hitting the person in the back that has the ball. That's called a quarterback, so I'm told. And so the quarterback is the one that gets all the fame and the glory and the star, right? That's not the manager. The manager's on the line of people keeping people from hitting the quarterback. Your people are the one doing the job. You're not the glory, they are. And that's how this works. So the communication part goes to that as well. What can I do to run? And I ask fourth question, every week, and I say, are you happy? Are you happy? And it's okay to say no. But if you say no two weeks in a row, we need to chat. Why are you not happy? What's wrong? What can I do? And it's just opening the door, and you're like, it can't be that simple. It's that simple. Just open the door. Are you happy? Are you happy? And then listen. Just listen. It's one of the most important things in communication is listening. Just listen. As men, often we are taught that our only value is utility. We fix things. My wife will say, there's a noise in the car. And I'll say, there is? Where? I don't know, it's just a noise. What do you mean just a noise? Was it in the front? I don't know, just making a noise. Well, I mean, was it like a thunking or was it a high noise? I don't know, it's just a noise. She was just making conversation. I think I have to go fix it. So after 36 years of marriage, the question when we start talking, I say, am I listening or am I fixing something? And she'll say, you're listening. And I'll say, great. And I go into listening mode and I nod a lot and I listen. And she'll say, no, you need to fix this. I'm like, let me get my toolbox and I will go out and wrench something, right? Seriously, 
You need to make sure you understand that we communicate differently. Next is coaching. Coaching is not mentoring. Normally, a direct boss should not be your mentor. The mentor should be on your board of directors, not your CEO of your career. The boss has too much power to be your mentor. So the boss should be someone who coaches you. What does a coach do? Hey, move your hands up the, there you go, just like that, just like that. Okay, when you're doing this, go backwards a little more. Great, good job. That's all part of coaching. You need to know how, what rewards someone and what motivates someone. Some people are motivated with money. Some people are motivated with, you did a great job. Some people are motivated with recognition. Some people are motivated by prodding them forward a little bit. Some people are motivated by not prodding them forward a little bit. You need to figure out how every one of your direct reports handles that. You need to know how to motivate them because we're humans. And sometimes we need to be pushed along a little bit gently. Don't overdo this part, but this part don't ignore. It needs to be done. The most important basic human trait, in fact, it's even in animals, is fairness. If I were to give everyone in here 10 pounds right now, and then I walk up and give you 50 pounds, visibly, you'll all hate this guy. Why did he get 50 pounds? What did he do? I'm just as good as that guy. Now, you've got 10 pounds you didn't have, but he got 50. That's not fair. We're fair people, and you've seen this. How come I'm getting all these tasks and she's not? So if you communicate and say, hey, we've all got this terrible thing to do. You pick which one you want to do. You pick which one. I'll take the rest. Now we're okay. But if I just say I need you to do this terrible thing, you don't like it because you think everybody else, what are they doing? How I'm busy. Why do you give this stuff to me? So make sure you're fair. I know that sounds patronizing. It's real. And you could think back to a bad boss you had right now. And you can say, that guy couldn't stand him because he wasn't fair. That lady was never fair with me, and so on. Finally, integrity. This is missed out on way too much. This is missed out on way too much. Be careful what you say. Keep your words soft and sweet because you may have to eat them. Make sure if you promise something, you do that thing. I promise very little because I have very little control over life. And when it all goes wrong, all that's remembered is I said this would happen. And when it doesn't, that's all that's remembered. Make sure you keep integrity. Never do anything illegal or immoral and never ask anyone else to do anything illegal or immoral. That's a baseline. That's a non-negotiable. That's a starter. If we could only get our politicians to do these things. In fact, wouldn't you like to work for this person? Wouldn't this be a great person to work for? Are you that person? Honestly. Tick it out on a piece of paper right now. Is this you? If it isn't, you should be making an action plan right now for how this is going to be you. Do you agree with it? All right, let me ask you. I've interviewed several managers and other luminaries here this week on this deck, and I was talking with Brent Ozar and folks like that yesterday, and I asked, what did I leave out? So hit me with something I left out. What have I left out? Anything? Anything online? Nothing online. Okay. Think this through. You're welcome to bring it up later. What I miss? What else makes a good boss? I think this covers it, but maybe not. Ah. Yep. Okay, very good point, and that's a, there's an uber point there. The comment was, I think you have to have a certain amount of confidence in yourself because it's hard to do these things without it. So there are some things behind this, aren't there? The ability to communicate means realizing that I talk to you differently than I talk to you. We were at the uh, charity event Thursday night. Whenever Bob and Anna and myself travel to a conference, uh, we make sure we do a charity event. We donate our speaker's fees to the event, and then we go do hands-on. And so the one here was the Greenwich Food Bank. And they had some little cards that is a shopping list. And you hand it out to people, and they buy something in the store, and they put it in a bin at the front, an area at the front for the homeless and the shelters and so on. So we were doing that. And a couple, I won't, I won't mention who, but there's about seven of us from Microsoft doing it. And uh, there's a couple folks that were having some difficulties giving away the cards. Because if I walk up to you at a grocery store with a card in my hand, 
you know, what are you thinking? The guy's trying to sell me something, right? So they were having a problem with that. And I got rid of all my cards. And they're like, how'd you do that? And so I'm like, oh, you know, you just, just walk up and talk to him. Let me, let me see your pitch. So I walked up to a guy and I said something and gave him the card and he took it. And they're like, oh, that's the way you behave. And I said, no, wait. And I walked up to another person and I gave them a card and they took it after I talked to them. And then I walked up to a different person and gave them a card and they took it. And they're like, well, you're not making the same pitch to anybody. And I'm like, that's right. Because they all talk different. They all think different, right? We all are different people. If you don't know this background as you're talking about having your self-confidence, there's a bunch of skills that are required before you get to any of these. You need to have those. Okay, we good? Yes, sir. Say that again. Availability is a great one. Yeah. Yeah, the comment from the room was availability is another one. This deals, in my mind, on the time management side. Um, we often fill our day with so much stuff as a manager to do, we haven't left any slack time for somebody just to give us a call. Very good point. And I've got some office hours that I keep for my employees. I also, also have told them, here's my number. If it's big, call me. I, I don't want to work off hours, but if it's that big that you need to call, you can. So that availability is very important. And you need to set your own boundaries. If you've got somebody that doesn't understand not to call you after you know, midnight or whatever, and they do it a lot, that's a thing. Right? Very good point, availability. Anyone else? Vision. The comment was vision. I like this. This, in my mind, goes into the business knowledge that we talked about. Uh, you need to know what your mission for your company is, what their culture is, and so on, and where they're headed. And if I can't communicate that to you, and by the way, if you're working, anybody working from home or just me? Just me working from home, okay. Um, I'm behind a screen. I talk to nobody else. I'm doing my job. I'm getting paid. And I start thinking, somebody comes along and says, hey, would you do that exact same job, but we give you a different color badge and we give you more money? What do I say? Sure because I have no connection to the vision of the company I'm in. I'm just a mercenary at this point. I'll just work for whoever. So if you're not communicating your corporate culture in an online world, and there's ways to do that, I'm going to give you some helps to do that. Your people are just going to go somewhere else because they're just mercenaries at that point. Interesting stuff. Okay, let's do a time check. We're in great shape. Now let's talk about what the original session was supposed to be about. Shall we? Mental health in the workplace and IT. So what do we think about when we think about mental health at work? Well, this is something I got from a resource. By the way, this deck has all the links. I make sure not to plagiarize if I can help it. Um, sometimes you can't help it. You say something and somebody else has already said it, but I try not to intentionally plagiarize. So this is in quotes, meaning I got it from somewhere else. And it says mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. All right, let me stop there for a moment. Mental health is in here. You don't get to see it. But what it does to me, you get to see out here. If I get congested, I cough. You don't know I'm congested until I cough. Are you with me? That's what this is. If somebody is thinking, feeling, or acting differently than they normally did, there's a mental health aspect. Now, there's still a huge stigma. We don't treat the brain like every other organ. You would have no problem if you had congestion taking a decongestant. But if I say I've had some real mental problems, I've got some medicine, you'd back up. You don't want to catch it. You might catch being crazy. Let me come over here. And we need to stop the stigma. I have a little secret for you. A little secret. Don't tell anyone. But we're all broken. Uh, Mike Tyson says, everybody's normal till you get to know them. And that's true. And everybody's family is great except yours. My family don't even, don't, no, we don't want to go there. My family's a wreck. My wife's is a wreck. Yours is fine. I'm sure you have a lovely family, no issues. You don't have a crazy uncle. Uh, you don't have that aunt that's vitriolic and, you know, wears her bra outside of her clothes. You don't, ha none of you have that. Just, just my family has that. Uh, but yeah, we're all broken. We're all broken, all right? It also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others, and make choices. Stress is unavoidable. We're going to have it. In fact, it's necessary. Life teaches us that you must have stress to grow. 
too much stress and you'll break something. It's interesting when you study engineering, there's two kinds of stress. There's lateral and there's vertical. Depends on how you pressurize something. You can have something that's turned on its edge that is very strong on its edge, but if you come at it from the side, you can break it like that. So stress is a very important thing to keep in mind, and we've seen the breaks. This is from an article called For Business in the UK. 40% of employees take time off of work as a result of mental health issues. If you're a manager, don't you want your employees to be available to you to do some work? Well, if they're taking time off because they're mentally stressed, because you're not paying attention, you're losing the productivity and you're a bad manager. Only one in five employees suffering from a mental health condition confide in their employer. Brent was telling me about some anecdotes he's had recently where they'll call Brent Ozar and, and commiserate with him because they're afraid to talk to their boss. Now, some of that's good. I like, my wife's got girlfriends and I've got guy friends and we don't always tell everything to both sets of people and so on. That's great to have an outlet. But you should be able to confide in your boss, man, I'm stressed, I'm, I'm messed up. Over 50% of employees don't feel that mental health is enough priority for their manager. Wow. Half the people in the UK reported that they don't think that their boss cares if they're mentally healthy or not. More than one in two employees, more than one in two employees state they would leave their job if mental health is not supported. Do we believe that's true? Well, with everybody switching jobs every day, yeah, I guess that is true. People are leaving their job because they feel, and this is kind of interesting, this is something I confirmed with several people that I've talked with recently, the people that are going to them and talking about things, it's not about money. It's actually not. It's about they don't feel they believe in what they're doing. That was the, that was the comment I got from several folks I interviewed this week. I don't believe, I just don't believe in what I'm doing. Have you ever heard the statement, people don't leave jobs, they leave bad managers? You ever heard that? It's actually very, very true statistically. Super important for us to think about. So, what are we going to do about it? Well, the organization has some responsibilities, your company. And you say, well, I don't, I don't run my company. Well, if you're a manager, you better have influence upward as well as downward. The interesting thing was I was talking with some folks when I asked them, what's a good manager? They all talked about the management of their people. That's true, that's important. Those things are very important. Almost none of them talked about their responsibility to the company. Isn't that interesting that your employees view that you have complete control over what the company does? Isn't that frightening? That's a very scary thought. They believe you're the company. So you better have influence. Not one of them came up to me and said, um, you need to manage sort of up as well. So I go back to my boss and I'm like, we've got a problem here. You may not be seeing, they're depending on you to do that because they're not seeing what you see. So what are the responsibilities? Well, in the UK, there's a law. There's a legal responsibility companies have. It's called duty of care. Companies have a duty of care. They need to make sure when you go into your building, it's not full of poisonous smoke. They need to make sure when you go into your building um, that there's a bathroom that works. That's a duty of care. But they also have to do this. Make sure the working environment is safe, protecting staff from discrimination, and carrying out risk assessments. Your company has a legal responsibility to do this. But the law is not enough. Come on, guys. We, we know better than just staying with what the law says. Here's what they really need to do. So if, you don't, if, you're not, if your company's not doing this, take a picture. Take a picture of this slide. Number one, they need to treat physical health and mental health as equally important. I think companies are starting to come around to this. I'm seeing more evidence of it, but back in the day, it's like, look, suck it up, buttercup. Just come to work, get your job done. I don't have time, there's no crying in baseball. Let's just get this done, right? And I think that's starting to change because what we do is we drive out people who may be prone to those sorts of things having issues or whatever, and we lose out on the value they provide. And some of those values, as I've just told you about BMW, can make you a ton of money. So it's just good business sense to take care of people physically and mentally. You need to make sure your employees have regular meetings to talk with their managers. I'm not talking about your one-on-one -on -one with work. I'm talking about, how are you doing? How are you doing? 
and you're like, I feel uncomfortable saying that, then quit being a manager. Go find a job. You need to quit doing that because I'm sick of working for people like that that don't care how I'm feeling. I, you're not a counselor. I don't expect you to like uh, suddenly be my best buddy or what, but ask the question. You doing okay? Everything all right? Right? You need to encourage positive mental health. For instance, arran arranging some training. Listen, saying, hey, look, I I'm not really good at this, but there are resources out there. We do care. Saying those words alone would be a huge improvement over nothing. Because what do we do as humans when we think about things? We are conditioned to think in the negative. And we think, okay, they don't care. And you're like, well, of course I care. My wife, I mentioned we've been married for 36 years. You never tell me you love me. Well, I told you I loved you when I got married. Nothing's changed. That's not how that works. That is not how that works. You say it every day. I tell her those three little words everyone loves to hear, whatever you say. Um, no. All right, so you need to also appoint some champions. If you're not good at mental health, then find someone who is. Tracy, would you mind standing up for a moment for us in the back? This is Tracy. She's actually here uh, at the conference as a counselor. She is a trained counselor here in the UK. This is her position. So if you haven't had a quick chat with her and gotten her card and, and say, what do I even do? She'll get you pointed in the right directions for how you can make use of a health professional. You are not a counselor. You are not a counselor. But you can get someone to the counselor and she doesn't work at your company. But she can, or someone like her, can help your people if you get them to her in the right way. We're gonna talk about that next. Any questions on what the company's responsibility is? Tracy, anything, any comments here? Right. Very good. What she just stated was you can often talk to somebody outside the company because there's a, there's a degree of an anonymity that you have, that you feel nothing's going to blow back on you, no one will know you're suffering, and so on. People need that anonymity at times. So very good point, Tracy. Thank you. All right, let's work to the final piece here. What can you do about it? What are your responsibilities? This is where we're gonna spend the bulk of our time. We're gonna have some resources and then we've got time for questions or we'll be done just a tad early. You can help first of all by understanding what mental health is. And you're like, wait, I got another thing to do as a manager? Yeah, you do, yeah, you do. This is important, this is important. When you're someone's manager, you have, your, you have their career in your hands and they're gonna go home tonight and tell their wife or their husband or their children or their partner or whoever they care about, I had a terrible work at, a day at work today. That's you. You did that. You did that. If you're unhappy with that level of responsibility, then don't be a manager. If you're like, I can make someone have a good, I, I had so much fun. I got somebody promoted recently and I was absolutely giddy all morning until she was awake so I could tell her. And by the way, just a quick point of order because we're all online, don't say I need to talk to you later. Don't, don't, don't do that. I told her, I said, I have some great news I wanna share with you. Do you have a few minutes? That's what I said. But don't say, we need to talk. Don't do that. <laughs> have you ever had that message you get from your man? My boss does this all the time. He's a great guy, I love him. And he'll say, oh, do you have a minute? And I'm like, no, I'm fired, aren't I? I'm sorry. And he's like, what? I'm giving you more money. Uh, oh, okay, well, then that's good. No, don't do that. Make sure you realize. It, it, put yourself on the other side. You know what that's called? That's called empathy. And that's the first skill I told you you need to have. Need to make sure, how is this going to sound to somebody? Maybe, maybe rehearse it for a second in your own head before you let it out. Well, they say always make sure the brain is engaged before you put your tongue in gear. Always make sure you do that. So you need to know what it is. Then make yourself a strategy. You should have a little OneNote 
or something where you lay out, here's what I'm going to do for mental health in my company. And this is not a checkbox. This is not something you're going to do and then you're done. It's not the way that works either. The way this works is every week, every month, am I checking in? Is this person okay? If you see a high amount of turnover, something's wrong, and the bosses should have already known it was going to happen. And if I ran a company and I had high turnover, I'd fire my managers because they should have known that was coming. And they should have told me, we need to raise pay, we need to have an offsite, we need to send everybody a gift card, we need to do something. And if they're not telling me that, they're afraid of me, and I don't want those people around. Your employees should never fear you. That's a given. But so many times, work is operated from a place of fear. So have a, a mental health strategy. Then tell everybody about it. Let your employees know there are resources available to them and say, hey, look, if you can't come to me, here's where you can go. And here's what I know, and here's some things you can do. I'm open, but I understand you may not want to come talk to me. Here's someone you can talk to. Because by the way, they're talking. Everyone in this room has been the, the topic of dinner conversation at somebody's house. And you might be a little surprised at what those discussions entailed. You know how I know that? Because I've done it. You've done it. They always used to say at our church, don't go home and have the preacher for lunch. Right? Well, he should have done this and she should have done that. Make sure you create an open discussion environment. You need to make sure they know. Uh, my daughter, when she was little, uh, she had a rule called amnesty. And she would walk up and say, she's like five, amnesty. And I'd say, okay, have a seat. If she would tell me what she had done wrong, there'd be no punishment. There would be repercussions. There might be like you took something, you got to take it back. You hit a kid, you got to go say sorry but there's no punishment for that. If you didn't say amnesty, mm, mm, daddy's coming, daddy is coming. So she knew that. I told her, you can tell me anything. You can tell me, and somebody asked me, when she's a teenager, she comes up and tells you she's sleeping around, is that okay? And I'm like, if she tells me, yes. If she doesn't tell me, isn't that worse? I want my daughter always, she's 27, I want her always to tell me anything. And your employees should be able to do the same, including you're awful. You're just the worst. I want them to be able to say that. And that means you have to sit there and go, okay. Now internally in your mind, you're going, no, you're awful. But what you have to do is go, okay, I understand. Tell me more, right? You have to be able to, if you can't, please don't be a boss. Go find something else to do. Stay in contact. One of uh, my direct reports, line item reporting items that I grade them on is who have you met this month and why? Because in this online world, I know I can call Stacy because I know her. I can call her and say, hey, what's going on? But if I just randomly phoned you, I'd say, how's it going? That's creepy. <laughs> That's really creepy. But right now I can say, how's it going? And you'll say, great because we have these face-to-face -face chance meetings. In the online world, we're only in our cone of knowledge and we can't just reach out. So find some natural, my, my direct report was like, how do I do that? I said, I don't know, what are, you, what are you working on, these things? Call somebody and say, I notice you're in charge of these things, do you have a minute? And just chat. And then that goes in your little book and you say to me, I've met so-and-so and so-and-so and they know me because. And I'm like, great, good job, you get a, you get a star. If they tell me, oh, I didn't meet anybody this week. Uh, wow, you better stop what you're doing. Go figure out somebody to meet. And she's like, every month? Every month. We're a big company, 100,000 people at Microsoft. You got to know them all. Got to catch them all. All right. Develop your listening skills. Guys, raise your hands. Every guy in this room, raise your hand. Go develop your listening skills. And yes, and yes, I just called you out. Sorry. I'm sorry, that's it. That's not politically incorrect, by the way. It's a thing. We don't listen. We do, and okay, anybody that knows databases, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you know databases. Okay, every one of you are doing a B-tree index every time somebody's talking. I was having a problem with this thing the other day, and, I, and the second we hit the index leaf row, we go, you should go do this. And the person goes, okay, I wasn't finished. No, no, I already know the answer. I've already done a B-tree index. I know exactly what's wrong with you. 
Don't do that. Don't do that. Let it go to a heap. Just let it go to a heap. And then sit there for a minute and think about it. Put your brain in gear and then talk. I had a guy that I knew when I lived in the UK. He's a preacher. And I was talking with him. And every time you would talk with him, he would just sit and look at you for about five seconds. And then he would answer. And I was like, so if one day I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to, I, don't, I hope this isn't indelicate. Why, why, do you, why do you do that? It's freaking me out. I talk kind of fast. I drink a lot of coffee. I don't know. It's what I do. And so I talk fairly quickly. Have you noticed that or no? Yeah. No, okay. Um, so uh, he didn't, decidedly. And he, I said, can I just, he said, when I was younger, my dad had died. I grew up in a rough neighborhood and I was a thug. And my grandmother came to me and she said, boy, if you don't slow down and turn off your mouth, somebody's going to kill you one day. Your mouth's going to get you into trouble. And he took it to heart so much that he refused to respond before five seconds. Can you imagine the problems you would have avoided in your life if you had taken a five count before you opened your mouth? I have no concept of that. But uh, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Assume good intent. When someone comes to you, make the assumption they're coming from a good place and get pushed off of that assumption. We always ensue bad intent. Oh, she's coming to me because she's angry. Well, maybe not. Maybe you did something stupid. Everything happens for a reason. Sometimes that reason is you were stupid and made really bad decisions. That has to be an option in the reason something's happened. Finally, know the professionals you can use. There's one right there. You need to find those folk. You are the front line. You are the front line. And you say, Buck, I haven't, I haven't really done any of these things you've talked about or I've done half of them or whatever. That's okay. The beautiful thing about life is every morning when you wake up, you get 24 new hours to start all over and be a better person. You can be Ebenezer Scrooge on Christmas morning every day. You really can. You can make a change. I'm going to let you take a picture, and we're going to go out on some resources, and I'm going to pop over and show them real quick. You can take a picture of this. This is specific to the UK, but your country will have a similar set of uh, resources. The first one is mentalhealth.gov. Do, do your employ Did you know this? Be honest if you knew this was here, if you knew it existed. There you go. You've learned something out of this session, if nothing else. Second, mentalhealthatwork.org.uk. Uh, great resource if you want. You can just go to that site, but if you go all the way to that article, I'll show you. And then bustle.com has a great article on burnout. Let me pop over to those, and we'll be done for today. Well, or done for this session. How's that? I want you to go to other sessions. Here's mentalhealth.gov, how to get mental health, get immediate help, veterans, health insurance, participate in a clinical trial, disaster preparedness, and so on. There is so much stuff in here. You can find out so many things. This is my quote that I stole, and so on. Here's the early warning signs. Here's the mental health and wellness. Here's resources. Here's where to find help. Make use of this site. The next resource I showed you was the Stevenson Farmer Review. This is where I got all the information about those percentages of people that are burned out, that don't feel like they can. I want to make sure you knew I had a resource for that. And then finally, this is a very interesting article uh, on bustle.com that talk. Oh, you know what? You're not seeing any of these. Oh, my gosh. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Ta-da. There we go. Look at that. All right. Uh, back to the original one I was saying. There's all kinds of resources here. Okay? And then if I can get to the thing, I'm looking at the side here. Here's the one for the report I told you about. And then as I mentioned, uh, bustle.com here, this article is really good on what we're getting uh, wrong about burnout and what burnout is. You know what burnout is? Oh, it's overworking. No. You know what burnout is? You no longer think about the future. What are you going to do next month? I, I can't think about that right now. You're burnout. You're burnout. 
if your employees, when you're asking them, hey, what are you working on next? I, I, I don't know, I really, nah, they're burnt out. You need to get help, you need to get help now. Everybody burns out, everybody burns out. We're all type A, we all want to do the right thing, all of us want to do the right thing. Uh, but definitely go find out if your employees are burnt out. All right, final slide. Um, I'm supposed to have on my final slide um, the QR code, but I took this over and I didn't get the little, uh, uh, one of the orange shirts. I would really like you to rate this session. How many of you found it useful? Raise your hand. Okay, good. That's all I care about, but the organizers need your feedback. Yes, ma'am. Right? Okay, if you go to the to schedule on the website or the schedule, depending on where you're at, uh, and you click on give feedback, you can find this session, mental wellness. Uh, definitely go check that. Please go fill that out. Make me a promise you'll go fill that out. Here's why. They base what they, who they bring back, number one, and number two, what kind of sessions they have. Do we want professional development sessions at this conference, or do you just want the tech? You just want me to show you how to use data science? So I can do both. But I think this is valuable. I think it's underrated. I think we're not doing this enough, and I'm tired of working for bad bosses. All right, I love you all. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Go out and learn some new things. If you have questions, feel free to hit me up in the booth. I'm going to go to my next session, but I will be around the conference all day today. Thank you for your time. It's the most valuable thing you have. <laughs>